Uh, so good morning. Um, my name is Andrew McLaughlin. I'm going to be uh, 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 leading the session uh, for the next hour. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, give a report on um, my experience uh, in Washington on the transition. So I uh, uh, normally work at Google, and I took off um, about uh, three months from Election Day to Inauguration Day. Uh, uh, to commute to DC, um, come back home to the Bay Area on the weekends, and uh, work as a member of the, the Obama-Biden transition team. And I was uh, working on uh, government transformation. So uh, the, the team was called uh, Tigger, um, or if you don't have um, two and a half year old children at home, you might call it Tiger. Uh, but this was the technology, innovation, and government reform uh, group in the transition. And um, the story that I want to tell and I, I want to walk you through is the story of a um, Bay Area nerd um, who goes to Washington and encounters some rather surprising obstacles. Um, and surprising in the sense that they are both um, uh, more um, uh, tenacious and more obscure than you might think. So the kinds of things that we were trying to do would be regarded as, uh, as kindergarten level rudimentary um, technology implementations in uh, the um, Silicon Valley private sector tech startup kind of world, um, but in government are viewed as a massive revolution in both form and approach. And um, the um, good news is that I think there is a reform agenda that makes sense and that I want to put in front of you as a, as a set of ideas for you to um, chew over and talk to your uh, elected representatives about. But I want to kind of walk you through some of the nitty-gritty detailed um, uh, barriers that stand in the way of realizing these either large or small, depending on your point of view, transformations in the way that we run our government um, uh, at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level. So that's my story. Uh, uh, naive uh, Mr. McLaughlin goes to Washington and uh, 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 learns some hard lessons and comes away with a renewed sense of hope. Um, and that's what I want to try to convey uh, to you. So this is um, a... Uh, 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 this is a um, um, path that we're going to walk together. So the promise of Web 2.0 in the world of government, it's pretty straightforward, it's pretty basic. Um, uh, we now have technologies that even eight years ago when the last administration was inaugurated um, were basically unthinkable, and that's because uh, the cost of computing power uh, is dropping at a, at a remarkable rate. Um, the cost of uh, transmission of data um, is also dropping, uh, and the cost of storage of data uh, is dropping. So, you know, if, you're, if you work at a place like Google, like I do, you work in a declining cost business. Every year, your um, cost for delivering the same amount of computing power, storing it, transmitting it across the internet, is lower than it was the year before. And so when you add this up across many years, the amount of computing power that is now freely available to the ordinary individual is something that um, uh, uh, 10 years ago, or as I said, eight years ago, would have been unthinkable. And so the central challenge, in a way, has been to try to explain to people who run big government systems how to use consumer-type technologies um, and to benefit from these massive increases in the um, cost effectiveness of computing. So the result, if you do this right, is that you can end up with a government that is more transparent uh, because more data is available. Uh, it is more participatory because there are more ways for people to interact with their government. Um, it is collaborative in the sense of people within the government working together. Um, and uh, it's more efficient in that it costs less. So the old paradigm was the massive, $80 million contracts that was taken out by a massive consulting firm or government contractor where they build a very unique and uh, proprietary system that fulfills the one purpose for which it was um, contracted. And the alternative new um, Web 2.0 model is that you build a lot of commodity computing power, uh, which is to say just raw data center, uh, data center style processing storage and transmission capabilities. And then you innovate and iterate lots of applications on top of it. 
Um, and so instead of blowing you know, $80 million on your one contract, you spend maybe $10 million for generic capacity, and then you're getting a much better um, sort of service. So this is what you want to aim for. Uh, uh, transparency, participation, collaboration, efficiency and effectiveness. And the sort of bullet point you know, for a government official is you can get a better government and spend less money. So this is the promise um, of Web 2.0 in the government space. Let me give you a couple of examples of people um, uh, that have been successfully using this approach um, in um, state and local government. So these were some of the examples on the transition that we looked at very closely to try to understand what was the, um, what was the uh, 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 potential. So the first one that I want to talk about is DC's CAPSTAT. So CAPSTAT is um, a collection of applications and initiatives um, that the District of Columbia government um, has put together starting about uh, two and a half years ago. Um, a new mayor, Adrian Fenty, was uh, elected. He um, hired very quickly a cabinet level chief technology officer um, named Vivek Kundra, and Vivek compiled a remarkable record of rapid fire innovation um, in uh, a government which had widely been regarded as one of the least functional um, in, uh, in the United States. Um, going back over 20 or 30 years. In fact, it's actually one of the best functioning governments um, in many respects. Um, and uh, technology has been a big part of the reason why that's become the case. So CAPSTAT is the successor to um, uh, a line of government technology innovations that you can sort of trace back to the New York City Police Department in the 1990s when they started using something called CompStat which was a, an effort to take all crime data uh, in near real time and get it uh, consolidated onto some maps that would enable the police department to allocate its officers and resources according to where the um, crimes were actually happening. So you see a little upsurge of crime over here, you surge your officers in and work that neighborhood very hard, and it's part of what led to um, the dramatic declines uh, in crime in New York City that were um, experienced in the 90s, literally 2x what the national decline in crime was in the 1990s. And a certain amount of that is attributable to uh, better policing through use of programs like CompStat. That model has since been adopted in a number of jurisdictions, um, notably in Baltimore, where Martin O'Malley, who was the mayor there, now the governor of Maryland, um, tried to take this CompStat model and use it citywide. So to try to get as many different agencies as possible to consolidate their data into common platforms and then um, uh, uh, enable decision making as a result. It's a, it's a data process and it's also a kind of management process where you try to figure out as a management matter, how do you rigorously use the data and put it to work um, uh, to deliver services. So a great example in Baltimore was they have a 311 system. They, they tried to evolve a two-number government, they called it. So uh, one number is 911 if you've got an emergency, and the other phone number is 311 if it's not an emergency. And so you call 311 for whatever it is you might need, and uh, the beauty of the system that they built called CityStat in Baltimore was that as soon as you call, um, your call, if it's, a, uh, if it's a complaint or a report about something like a pothole, let's say, it's immediately ticketed. That ticket is handed off to the responsible agency, and the um, uh, call gets documented up on a website. You can actually look at a map and see these things uh, as a citizen, see what's being reported when it comes in. And the rigorous data tracking that they applied enabled them to say, we will um, give a 48-hour pothole guarantee. So if you report a pothole, we will repair it within 48 hours. And they were able to reach you know, about 96, 97 percent um, success rates um, with that kind of a system. So anyway, so um, let's take a look at DC's implementation, which is, um, which is uh, the latest kind of greatest iteration of this. So um, uh, all 911 and three report, uh, 311 reports now uh, can be seen online. Um, there's a web page. Uh, same day, and there's full tracking to resolution. So until the point at which it's resolved, you will see a live dot on the map with, that gives you data about it. Um, every city agency uh, is required to provide public data feeds. So these are data feeds that can be used for any purpose, but in particular are used by uh, uh, CapStat to um, uh, provide uh, structured, meaningful information to citizens about what's going on. I note, though I think this may be totally attributable to a number of other causes, 
that uh, the homicide rate in Washington is down about 20% um, over the course of 2007, which was the last year I could find statistics for. Probably whole, got a whole bunch of factors, but maybe data-driven policing that utilizes a lot of this data might be a, 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 a part of that. So let me show you exactly what this looks like. This is the CAPSTAT mapping application. As I said, it's publicly available. What I've done here is I've entered uh, one DuPont circle as our address, so that's uh, kind of a, uh, a nice neighborhood uh, to live in in DC. Um, and I've chosen over here, you know, the last seven days, let's see all service requests. And uh, I can click here and see that uh, there's a parking meter out of order. It's been assigned to the responsible agency, which is the Department of Transportation. It's overdue. Ticket is still open. The due date was uh, April 2nd, which is yesterday. So this is great data, um, and it's available as, as downloadable data sets. You can visualize it through this mapping application, um, and it's useful both for decision makers in the city and also citizens. They both get to see the same thing. So the mayor, if he wants data, just goes to this public web page because it's just as accurate, just as up-to-date um, as anything he's got internally. And so this one single system uh, you know, feeds everybody. There's no reason to keep this kind of data secret. A related... Um, uh, 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 initiative is what they call the data catalog. So the office of the CTEO set out to create a website that pulled together just large data sets and made it possible for people to easily find the data, mash up the data, and, um, uh, and uh, use it in whatever way they want to. So you know, here you see uh, the kind of front page. There's lots and lots of data that lies behind this. But um, you know, it's everything from crime statistics like juvenile arrests and charges, uh, to current construction projects, to computer deployments across city government, um, building permits, public space permits, um, all of this data is kept up to date and accessible here. One of the things that they also did, which I thought was a great idea, was they set up an innovation contest called Apps for Democracy. But the idea was they gave $20,000 worth of award money to developers who created applications that utilized the data. Um, and there's lots and lots of um, you know, applications that I thought were pretty interesting, pretty impressive. Um, there's a, uh, uh, both a, a, a jury, there was both a jury award process and a, a people's choice awards. Um, and one of the applications that I thought I would just note is one that somebody put together called Stumble Safely. So this is a guide to bars and how to avoid crime when you are leaving the bar at night. And so what you see here is the locations of bars and the locations of major crimes. So here's Chief Ike's Mambo Room. Here's an assault. Here's an assault. Here's a robbery. Uh, I note somewhat depressingly that uh, the crime seems to be pretty well distributed, but I guess if you go west, maybe you're going to um, have your best route of escape. Um, but anyway, you can see the data here for night, for evening, for daytime. And again, it's just built on top of real-time updated, publicly accessible data um, uh, that the city makes available. Um, this was one of the, I think, uh, silver medal uh, winners in their, in their contest. Um, so um, let me talk about another example then, which is a, a, the, the use of a Web 2.0 type platform for um, uh, structuring government data and then making decisions as a result. So um, this is a, a, an example called Virtual Alabama. Virtual Alabama is, um, is a consequence, in a sense, of Hurricane Katrina. So in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, um, uh, Governor Riley in Alabama felt that he um, really lacked any um, semblance of the data that he felt he needed as a governor. So they would be, you know, he tells a story about how he was flying over uh, some devastated coastland in the Gulf, and he sees, um, you know, from above uh, where these houses are destroyed, where the um, shoreline is hitting, where the sandbars are, and so forth. And he asks his uh, chief technology officer to see some imagery that would show what this looked like before, like he wanted something to compare it with. And they said, well, we, didn't, we can probably get that from somebody. But anyway, it, was, it was not immediately handy. And so he asked the uh, chief information officer, um, of the state, uh, who's a very innovative, thoughtful person, um, to go try to build a system that would give him, as the chief executive of the state, much better um, data tools to be able to deal with disasters like Hurricane Katrina. And so what they stumbled into, in a sense, um, or, or, or sort of uh, backed into, 
was using a geo platform. In this case, it's Google Earth, but I'm not, I promise I'm not just shilling for, for the product. It just happens to be one that I know about. Um, they used Google Earth as a back-end platform for all geocodable state data. In other words, this started off as an emergency response idea, and then it basically evolved to be an organizing principle for a tremendous amount of state data. Um, and you'll see what I mean about this. So uh, it starts off as an emergency platform, becomes a back, uh, backbone and the res uh, of sort of government data management. And um, the, the, the critical point here is that their total cost for the enterprise license, in other words, for a private, secure version of Google Earth that they can run on their own servers, was about $180,000. Um, and if you compare that to the amount of money that states typically spend on IT contracts, I mean, uh, anything less than $20 million usually gets sneezed at or ignored in the grand, you know, in the margins of the budget. So, um, you know, the amount of money that you have to spend in order to get a much better um, outcome is, is, is uh, an order of magnitude or, or more less than what you were spending before. Um, so, like I said, total cost about 160,000 bucks plus two staff. It currently supports 550 agencies, meaning state and local governments and state agencies. Um, they went from 10 days from the governor making this request to having a functional system um, up and running. They were able to iterate it very quickly. And it's basically enabled the state, in one sense, to mothball its emergency operations center, um, meaning that um, now, if the governor needs you know, access to um, very rich data, he doesn't have to go to a room somewhere in the state capitol. He just has to pop open a laptop um, and uh, log into virtual Alabama and see all the data as it's being uh, as it's either stored or as it's being um, added to by emergency responders and first responders out in the field. All right, let me show you what I'm actually talking about because that will make this even more clear. So here's an example of what uh, the governor gets to see. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's typical Google Earth, just sort of a geo platform. What's critical about the, the, the approach here is that they said, we want to get everything possible onto one platform. So that means we'd like to see the locations of all power lines the locations of all sewer lines, uh, gas lines. We'd like to see um, the locations of all state buildings, floor plans for all state buildings, floor plans for all schools. Um, we want to see evacuation routes, flood plains, zoning data, election returns uh, at the precinct level, historical data, uh, locations of cell towers, real-time locations of emergency vehicles with, uh, that are equipped with GPSs, um, and so forth and so on. So anyway, any, any state asset um, anything that might be important to an emergency responder, fire, earthquake, uh, hurricane, um, uh, uh, shooting, um, or active violence, whatever it might be, um, it all goes onto the same platform. And you know, with a reasonably intelligent model for permission and access controls, um, you can really um, uh, uh, push this data out to state employees. So not only the governor can pop open a laptop, but a a uh, police officer who's driving towards the scene of some reported uh, uh, emergency can, again, just pop open the laptop, log in, and start looking at all the data that might be relevant. So let me give you some examples. Um, here is, uh, you know, for example, uh, a 3D area um, of Huntsville, uh, sort of downtown Huntsville. And what you see here is, you know, a few data layers, like, for example, cameras. If you want to see CCTV cameras, you can just go click uh, on one of these um, and see the images that they're seeing in real time. That might be very useful if you're trying to understand a situation. You can see the locations of emergency response vehicles and um, major facilities. Um, here's an example of a, of a uh, laboratory um, at a state university. Um, and it allows you to very quickly click in to see a camera in a hallway. Um, if there's one there, you can click in to see a floor plan um, of, the, uh, of the building if, uh, if you need to see it. And, uh, uh, here's a um, picture of a, of a modeled um, uh, uh, chemical release. So uh, some kind of toxic chemicals are released from this uh, storage facility over here, and it shows you with a certain wind uh, direction where the uh, downwind affected area is going to be. Um, so you can do planning. Here's uh, floodplains uh, for a river. If the river reaches you know, uh, X number of feet above its uh, flood stage, and you can see exactly what's going to be affected and so forth. So this is all data that the state's been sitting on, right? So different agencies of the state are sitting on the data. It's just been, you know, uh, gathering dust or, or, or waiting for somebody to come unearth it and use it. And by putting it all together on a common platform, you're ready for whatever might uh, happen. Um, 
One thing that's interesting is a matter of just kind of bureaucratic uh, uh, organization is that the state uh, and the governor did not send out an order that said to everybody, you must uh, move your data onto this platform. What they, uh, because you know, there are county governments and local governments that are at least nominally independent of the state and have their own electorates and so forth. So you can't just kind of order them around. You can order the state agencies that report to the governor, but not the local ones. But much of the really interesting data is going to be held by those very local units of government. So um, the uh, governor's approach instead was to make it a, an attractive trade-off. So what he says is if you want access to virtual Alabama, then you have to give us your data and you have to keep it up to date. So if you play, we'll give you access to the statewide system. If you don't play, fine, you know, but you won't get access to the system. And that actually has been extremely effective. Uh, it's, a, it's an attractive approach rather than a coercive approach. And in the environment of uh, you know, a complex and uh, often um, proud bureaucracy, um, uh, uh, that's a very effective uh, approach. I'm sort of wondering if uh, the reporting on the, the stimulus bill could apply to the federal uh, government, we don't have the mandate there. So Tim's question is, what about the reporting in the stimulus bill? Is the same thing going to be true? I think, the, I think it is absolutely I, also, I think it's the only way that the reporting in the stimulus bill is going to be made effective. So there are mandates in the stimulus bill that say if you get stimulus money, you have to report. But I hope that they will also uh, try to set it up so that you look good politically if you do play ball. Um, you know, a local congresswoman of ours, for example, uh, Doris Matsui, uh, was the first out of the gate as the first member of Congress, um, she's from the Sacramento area, to list all of the stimulus-funded projects in her district. Um, so if you go to her website at the House, um, you'll see a, a nice um, graphic uh, using maps that shows you what's getting funded by the stimulus. And I think it's, it makes her look good. And so hopefully, you know, sort of positive political competition will drive those same kind of, um, those same kind of uh, dynamics. Um, I have a little bit of video of Google Earth, but I think I'll skip that. The stills basically capture um, how it works. Um, just from an internal management perspective, there's also uh, an important set of innovations that were done in Washington State. So Governor Christine Gregoire there was very innovative um, over her first term um, and uh, uh, created a system that they call GMAP, which is Government Management Account and Accountability Process. And the GMAP program is basically a very performance-driven, data-driven approach to managing the state government. One of the things that they did that I really like is the governor set a series of horizontal objectives. So it would be things like clean up Puget Sound, move people from welfare to work, um, uh, protect at-risk children, um, and, uh, and, and that affected multiple agencies. And then she, as governor, would chair monthly uh, meetings where the relevant agency heads would have to come in, uh, just like if you remember the New York Police Department story. I don't know if you've ever seen The Wire, but The Wire uh, on TV, uh, uh, often showed these meetings where the police chief sits down here with his data guru and then the local commanders have to stand up there and talk through what's been happening in their districts and it's very tough questioning back and forth. Um, Governor Gregoire took a similar approach which was to have the agency heads come and basically uh, report month by month how they're doing um, on the goals that she set. So a goal would be, for example, how do we move um, the uh, the response rate for child abuse calls from 69% where it was, 69% um, within 24 hours, where it was when she took office, to closer to 100%. And so um, it was a cooperative process. The agency head would come in and uh, um, talk about what was working, what was not working. The governor wasn't there to kind of like punish, um, but rather to figure out what the problems were and help. One of the things that I love about this process is that she did it in public. So the public could come and sit in on these meetings, and they videotaped them, and they put them up on a state website uh, sh uh, right after the meeting. That's very transparent. You know, this is the governor, governor sort of letting the public into the basic core management process of the state, which is set goals, hold people accountable, work through the problems. Um, and uh, you can see that they got you know, their highway projects completed on time. They got uh, their uh, child abuse response rates. They doubled job placement rates. They had the lowest traffic facility rate in history. And um, it's all built on data. Um, and the beauty of it is that it's data that the public gets to see just as the governor gets to see it. So an example of what this looks like is uh, the agency head dashboard. So this is for the Transportation um, and Infrastructure Bureau in, in, state, uh, in the state of Washington. And this gives you an idea of kind of the 
dashboard that the head of the agency gets to see and is also available to the public. So this is the you know, statewide project inventory, and I, I'll spare you the details other than to say that you know, it's um, um, uh, up on the web if you want to uh, drill down. But an individual project looks like this. You know, here's an east marginal way overpass uh, in, in Seattle, and you can see the uh, uh, date that it was designed, when it was constructed, when it's going to be open to traffic, how far they are along, um, how much money have they spent so far, how much is budgeted. Um, and uh, it's an incredible amount of transparency into these projects. And if what you're trying to do is keep projects on budget and on time and stop corruption, um, there's really no better tool than, uh, than, than, than this. Um, so uh, let me give you one last example, which um, I think is kind of a fun one, uh, which is called C Click Fix. Um, this is something that's basically been hacked together by uh, some people in Connecticut uh, and elsewhere. And it's basically uh, you know, trying to provide this sort of uh, reporting service um, for any community uh, nationwide. So this is my neighborhood in, in Noe Valley. Um, and uh, uh, you can see here that people file reports like skunks take over Sunnyside Park. <laughs> Large group of skunks have moved into Sunnyside Park. They are spraying and making the park smell so bad you can't use it. Five additional people want this fixed. Uh, you know, and, <laughs> What's cool about this is that um, uh, I can create a watch area here. So I can go in and um, uh, you know, define a polygon like this, let's say, uh, around my neighborhood and say, anytime somebody creates a report here, I want you to send me an email, or you can do it by RSS feed. Um, and, uh, and, and it's a really nice kind of like back-end platform. And this is just done by you know, a group of people who think that this functionality should be available nationwide. No reason that local governments can't do it. Um, but when the data you know, is, um, uh, is publicly available, either because the government has it or people are generating it, you can do a lot with it. All right, so I'm sitting there on the transition, and I'm you know, sketching out memos that try to make the case for um, the government to build around commodity computing and uh, start to you know, innovate applications on top of it, move away from these stovepipe contracts and so forth. Here are some of the obstacles that I ran into. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay them out in um, a little bit of detail, um, uh, just because I think it's important to understand, if not so much understand the details, at least understand the kinds of things that you run up against in Washington um, when you try to uh, bring Web 2.0 to government. And then I'm going to end with some notes about how I think we can you know, sort of move forward uh, despite these obstacles. So the first th set of things that I ran into are what are called acquisition and procurement rules. These are the rules and processes by which the, the US government um, uh, 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 gets anything from a chair um, to a, uh, 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 an Air Force uh, fighter jet uh, to a computer system. And so um, the qu kinds of questions that were raised is, you know, if the government wants to use a free online service like Flickr uh, or Facebook or YouTube, does it have to go through a competitive bidding process? Um, even though it's free, it's a competitive market, and there are lots of providers, and uh, shouldn't the government have to go through it? And a competitive bidding process, I can tell you, is a very elaborate, painful, time-consuming, excruciating process that uh, uh, that very few free online services are going to be incented to go and take part in. They would have to complete endless amounts of paperwork and so forth. And it seems kind of crazy if what you're talking about is basically the gratuitous use of free applications that are free to everybody in the world. Why should the government have to go and do a competitive bidding process just to go and use it? Um, and so one of the things which, uh, which uh, has emerged as a kind of middle ground in this debate has been what are called uh, uh, gratuitous service agreements. So uh, in this case, the um, General Service Admi Administration, the GSA, which is kind of a, a tech service provider, provides everything from the furniture to cleaning services, uh, operates buildings, um, and also provides a lot of the web hosting for federal agencies, just signs a single agreement with um, uh, YouTube or Flickr or um, in, in the case of video, Vimeo, Blip TV, they've done all these agreements. And then on the basis of that one agreement, any federal agency can go in and use it. Um, that makes perfect sense. But, but uh, and the Library of Congress has done this with a number of, of, of providers too. The thing to keep in mind about this though is that, is that governments can't just 
suddenly show up and start using um, uh, uh, free online services because um, the terms and conditions that those free online services uh, publish and, and apply to their products apply to all of their users. If the federal government is a user, then it's potentially subject to those terms and conditions. And for a bunch of reasons, the federal government has to protect itself from terms and conditions that it may not uh, like. There's another problem with advertising, which is that agencies are um, uh, restricted from carrying advertising for private individuals or firms or corporations. And so, you know, for example, a White House channel on YouTube or uh, uh, photo stream um, or a page on, on Facebook has to not carry advertising alongside it because otherwise that would put it in the position of um, uh, implicitly endorsing the things which are being advertised. So um, again, you, they had to come up with kind of like special arrangements with these Web 2.0 services. A specific example is what's called indemnification and there's a, uh, a, um, a statute called the Anti-Deficiency Act which basically prevents agencies from incurring potential debts or obligations um, beyond certain limits. It's kind of a sensible general idea. You don't want your uh, agencies to be able to just go out and suddenly incur a billion dollars of potential liability unless it's been somehow accounted for and, um, uh, and signed off on by, uh, uh, by the federal government through the budgeting process. And so, um, federal, so there are statutes that, that, that give you some guidance here. The problem is most online Web 2.0 services have indemnity clauses in their um, uh, terms of service which are unlimited. So you know, if I'm running a Web 2.0 service uh, and uh, um, um, uh, what I'll say is if you're using my service, you hold me harmless. You agree to pay all of my costs from anything that you do that's illegal, against my terms, um, but you're the one, you're potentially liable for the total amount of damage that you caused me through our relationship. The federal government can't agree to that. Um, the statutes just prohibit it. So for example, you know, the Veterans Administration wanted to use uh, Second Life um, uh, for uh, uh, rehabilitation uh, purposes and uh, the Linden Labs contract says unlimited liability, the VA is limited, and so they actually have to go and negotiate a special agreement um, and the Web 2.0 firm has to agree to make that uh, to make that um, uh, change. Another problem is legal jurisdiction and venue. So almost all of the boilerplate language that goes with Web 2.0 services, just like any you know, click wrap agreement or shrink wrap agreement or any you know, generic boilerplate agreement that you're used to says that the, this you know, contract will be governed by the law of the state of X and venue will be in you know, Los Angeles or San Francisco or Delaware or whatever it is but it always specifies that. The federal government is not subject to state law. It's only subject to federal law, and so it can't agree to terms and conditions that would potentially subject it to state law. So for these reasons, you know, even just signing up for a free online service is uh, harder than you might think. Next cluster of problems. These are access problems. So uh, the first one is, is basically just you know, employee access and use of social media, um, a lot of uh, agencies explicitly prohibit um, employees from using social networking sites uh, during work hours. Um, uh, this is because they've just been presumed to be social rather than work-related or personal rather than um, job-related. Um, but uh, uh, one of the things that I think needs to change is that we need to establish a presumption um, that uh, access to these kinds of sites is okay unless you've got some kind of job-related reason not to be doing social networking. Um, but that's a, a, an existing problem at a number of agencies. Another set of problems uh, have to do with dis uh, disabled access, what's called Section 508. So Section 508 is part of the Rehabilitation Act, and it basically says that uh, access to information should be equal between disabled and non-disabled employees and between disabled and non-disabled citizens. So people inside the agency, outside the agency, it's, it's supposed to put information services on an equal footing. Um, so you know, can the government sign a contract with a Web 2.0 service that is not Section 508 compliant? Technically speaking, they probably can, but the spirit of Section 508 is that government data, as the government communicates with people, should be equal between disabled and non-disabled people. So again, this can be a barrier if the Web 2.0 service is not Section 508 compliant. And what that means is following a series of web standards 
um, that are built around but not identical to the W3C's uh, web accessibility um, standards. Um, and uh, are not actually fully standardized, even at this point, by the way, that's still ongoing. Now, there are some positives about Web 2.0. So some of the things which are now coming out in online video services, uh, for example, are like auto-captioning of online videos. That's a great thing. That's actually going to really help government, which has had to pay for um, uh, you know, transcribers to go in and transcribe videos in order to make them Section 508 compliant. Uh, Web 2.0 uh, offerings can do that automatically now and for free. So that's great. But still, there's this Section 508 um, issue. One question is whether this uh, Section 508 applies to embedded content. You know, what if you want to embed a, a video or an image or something that's hosted on a third-party site into a government blog, let's say, or a government uh, profile on Facebook or whatever? Um, you know, does that original um, embedding site, uh, uh, or at least the bits that embed it, have to be Section 508 compliant? Um, Finally, there's a Freedom of Information Act issue, um, uh, which is, you know, FOIA says that, uh, that uh, uh, government data is presumably open to the public, or at least up until eight years ago, that's what we thought FOIA said, and then the presumption flipped, but now the presumption is back, so now again, government information is presumably available to the public. Um, President Obama has instructed the government to, uh, to make that uh, presumption meaningful, which is great. It was one of the things he did on day one, was reverse the, the so-called Ashcroft memo. But so anyway, FOIA has some interesting problems. There's the challenge of iterative media. In other words, um, uh, you know, which versions of a document or a wiki page or uh, a government um, uh, comment forum, uh, whether it's internal or external, you know, which version is subject to the FOIA requests? Um, you know, if you think about Wikipedia, it archives, or, you know, Wikisite archives all of the pre previous versions. Does this mean we have to start producing the drafts or earlier versions of everything, or is it the version as of the date FOIA was filed? It's just an open question under, under FOIA. Another is there's a, a bit of a danger of disclosure of, for example, user login data. So FOIA is not intended to capture personal data, um, but it's not clear on this point um, about, you know, sort of, uh, let's say, a database of users who provided comments on a particular bill, um, that might be uh, data th uh, that would really discourage people from commenting if it was subject to FOIA disclosure. You know, if you wanted to say, I want to know the email addresses um, and login IDs of, and IP addresses of everybody who provided a comment on this particular EPA rule, you really don't want to discourage people um, for fear that a FOIA is going to lead to the disclosure of that data uh, inappropriately. Um, so. Uh, uh, so th those are some access problems. Privacy and security is, you know, pretty obvious. Um, one thing that surprised me when I got to the uh, federal government, I mean, when I got to the transition, was uh, there is an OMB policy dating to the year 2000 that is a, 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 a fairly hardcore prohibition on persistent cookies. So um, this was an outgrowth of a, a sort of... Uh, uh, privacy scandal at the time, if you remember, that involved DoubleClick. So you remember that DoubleClick was doing cross-site you know, tracking, and uh, it turned out that some government uh, websites were you know, utilizing this kind of a cookie. And so OMB issued a circular that said, stop using persistent cookies on any website. There is a workaround mechanism if you get the approval of the head of your agency. But you know, humorously, that is the president in the case of whitehouse.gov. And so you know, do you really want to have to like, go and get the president to agree to persistent cookies? It, just, it didn't happen anyway until now. Um, and so, um, so uh, 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 basically, federal websites, except in a few cases where they've gone through this process, um, can't you know, remember preferences or settings across sessions. You can't um, uh, gather website analytics and, and, uh, and so forth. And so anyway, this is an area that we need to fix. We need to be able to use uh, cookies there's a related uh, question, which is about third-party websites and embedded content. So um, this came up in the context of YouTube videos that are hosted, for example, on the White House blog and embedded. Um, they had to cook up a workaround so that a YouTube cookie would not be dropped onto a user's computer just for going to the whitehouse.gov blog and having the embedded video appear. So now uh, you have to actually click through and go off to the YouTube site. You can't watch the videos. Uh, in the blog itself, like you can on most uh, embedded uh, media. And that was because they needed to protect themselves against violating this OMB circular um, uh, about persistent cookies. Um, so uh, anyway, privacy considerations, there are IT security considerations. I won't say much about these, um, other than that there is a, an extremely rigorous um, 
set of uh, requirements that are called the FISMA requirements, which is the Federal Information Security Management Act. And f anyway, the way that it defines federal information systems is pretty broad. It also includes contractors systems. Um, and so a system that the federal government is using um, has to undergo a rigorous security review. So if it's public-facing stuff, that's not such a big deal because um, you, you, know, you don't care about access breaches because the federal information is you know, public. So status updates on Facebook or YouTube videos, that's not really an issue. It's if the federal government wants to start using Web 2.0 services uh, internally to get its work done, then probably it's going to have to be subjected to this rigorous security process. And again, if you're a startup or you're a small Web 2.0 firm and you want the federal government to be using your services, you're going to have to be prepared to go through a painful and potentially expensive process of certifying the security um, of, your, uh, uh, of your systems. Now, these are my favorite because these are the most Orwellian. The management statutes. Uh, so the first one is the comically misnamed Paperwork Reduction Act, um, which dates back to originally 1980. It was revised in 1995. Um, and it, it responds to a real but somewhat counterintuitive problem. And that is that the problem that was identified was that the federal government was asking for too much input. Um, and thereby generating too much paperwork on behalf of affected businesses and individuals. So the, the optimistic uh, way to um, understand this statute is there was an effort to try to rationalize and centralize the ways in which the government asks for information so that they're as efficient as possible. A more cynical view would be that if you were an ideological opponent of government, you want to make it as difficult as possible for the government to ever ask citizens or businesses to ever do anything um, by tying it up in enormous amounts of red tape um, through uh, the Office of Management and Budget. So um, I'll leave it to you to decide how to interpret uh, the, the act. But here's what it means in practice, is that to collect information through, for example, an online survey, you have to go through basically a six-month OMB review and certification process before you can publish that survey. So if you want to just sort of like throw up an input mechanism on some issue that's going on, uh, this is uh, quite a barrier, and a very real barrier. Now, to be a little bit more specific, what it, what it applies to is solicitations of input and ideas that involve particular data about users. So um, this is not uh, you know, to ask a kind of generic uh, policy uh, question, you know, like should uh, uh, the death penalty be applied to 17-year-olds? Uh, you don't have to worry about that. But if you're, if you're saying um, something where you want people's stories or their personal experiences, but something that's personal, then um, the Paperwork Reduction Act applies. Um, it applies to uh, that kind of data. So anyway, it can contribute, it can trigger these um, OMB processes uh, and um, it applies to you know, websites and web surveys. So this is a very real problem and one that's gonna have to be addressed. A related one is the Presidential Records Act. So the Presidential Records Act uh, is, a, is a wonderful thing. It requires that all documentary records, all documentary material um, that the executive office of the president generates um, is to be kept. Uh, and these are the massive piles of paper that get shipped off to the presidential libraries um, where it's locked up for some number of years that eventually becomes open to historians and scholars. But um, it's really taken very seriously, you know, keeping a record of everything that went on in the White House. The problem is that um, it requires that everything be kept in paper. So no lie, government webmasters have to sit and print snapshots of their websites uh, on, a, on a regular basis. If you do a blog post, you've got to print it. Um, and this becomes a real headache when you've got a website that takes comments, for example, because then you've got to be printing paper versions of all. Anyway, so it's, it's uh, pretty ridiculous. Um, and so you can imagine the questions that get raised here. You know, what about third-party websites? What about status updates on Facebook? You know, does an agency doing a status update on Facebook have to save that in paper form? Uh, answer, yes, currently. So, um, uh, you know, we need to enable electronic storage of electronic records. Um, and that is, of course, a solvable problem. We know how to do that, but we need to go through and do it because right now, you know, you've got uh, webmasters that are basically blowing a lot of time to print uh, content on their websites um, in order to comply with the Presidential Records Act. Um, and the last one that I want to mention here is uh, commercial endorsement. 
So um, commercial endorsement is something that's very, very important for the White House in particular. The president should not be endorsing products or services. Um, and the White House Counsel's Office takes this very seriously, as they should. They are extremely, extremely careful about keeping the presidency and the office of the president and the person of the president away from any endorsement of particular products or services. Um, and so the question about you know, the government using a website uh, or, a, or a, a video embedding service like YouTube then becomes a very interesting one. Um, is the president endorsing YouTube by including YouTube videos uh, embedded on a, um, on a government blog? And the question is kind of like, well, if the president gives an exclusive interview to the New York Times, uh, but not the Fargo Forum, um, is the president endorsing the New York Times over the Fargo Forum? And the answer is no, we've never really thought about it that way, right? There are objective reasons for why the president wants to use um, the New York Times uh, as a, or, or you know, this week with uh, George Stephanopoulos. You know, like if he goes onto one particular show, that's not the same thing as commercial endorsement. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, you know, YouTube, for example, is just a platform. It's not exactly a reporter, you know, asking questions and engaging in an editorial interaction. It's just sort of a service. So I don't know, it kind of feels like a media outlet. It kind of feels like uh, just a plain old commercial service and hard to know exactly how to think about it from a, a commercial endorsement uh, context. Same thing with you know, Facebook. What if you put up a profile, you know, have a White House channel or, um, on Facebook or have a Twitter account? You know, is that somehow commercial endorsement in this competitive landscape? And what the White House has been doing, which I think is the right way to do it, is being very uh, sort of broad-minded and making sure that it provides videos in downloadable MP4 formats, it uses multiple different video services, it rotates the embedding um, uh, uh, sometimes so that uh, different services like Blip or Vimeo um, get, uh, get highlighted and used, it includes links to them in all events. That's probably the best way to do it um, if it's on some objective basis, but anyway, it's, um, it's always an issue for the White House to stay away from commercial endorsements. Okay, so these were some of the things that I encountered. They were a little bit surprising to me, um, and um, I just want to say that they are going to prove to be more thorny and tenacious than we think. I thought, you know, we could wipe away most of this stuff on day one with an executive order or two. That's not the case because, uh, uh, and I, I wrote the draft, but it didn't go anywhere. Um, and that's because, uh, that's because um, uh, some of it is statutory. They're actually statutes. And the way that you reinterpret statutes is through regulations or through rulemakings, and that takes time. You have to initiate the rulemaking. Uh, you have to work it through the um, Administrative Procedures Act process. And, uh, um, and there are some things that are within uh, the, 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 the purview of the uh, presidency to do on, um, on its own. Um, but there are many things that require the cooperation of Congress and so forth. So that gets me, so we do need to change these rules, and I noted you know, some of the ones that I think need clarification, refinement, adjustment, um, or whatever. But the real point that I want to raise is, 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 um, is about culture. So the way that we're really going to get a better government is to change the culture of government, and that's very hard to do. Um, it is, uh, it, it is um, uh, a laborious process. Um, but there are some really good people uh, around the federal government. I got to know some of them when, when I was um, uh, on the transition. And it was interesting to get to know people at GSA, at the State Department, at DHS. Um, there are little sort of cadres of people who are very web savvy, very ambitious, very energetic, very anxious to try to change their agencies and to try to make them more open, more transparent, more participatory. They really want to do it, but they run into these kinds of headaches and they run into a bureaucratic culture which doesn't really value this. I think the good news is that uh, President Obama really personally gets this. I mean, one of the bills that he wrote when he was in the Senate was um, a, a bill to make all uh, earmark and spending and budget related data easily searchable through a, a web interface. Um, and uh, uh, he did that with Senator Coburn, who's a very conservative Oklahoma senator. There's a real kind of political alignment around these objectives, but it requires people. Uh, we need to seed good people into these different agencies. Um, uh, uh, those of you that are interested in this area and that are skilled in this area, I would urge you to keep your eyes out for these jobs when they come open and try to embed yourselves um, in federal agencies um, in their tech uh, uh, and new media uh, groups, in their communications departments, um, in, uh, in the leadership. Um, and uh, 
my note to you as voters is you need to talk to your electeds and your candidates about this because um, this is the kind of thing that will happen slowly or it will happen more rapidly depending on whether there's pressure. And the way to generate pressure is to raise expectations um, for what's possible and to clue these people in to what they might be able to accomplish. You know, the, the talking point here I think is, you know, use good technology, you get better and cheaper government, you get reelected. You know, it gives you something to run on. But um, it's a point about uh, uh, people, um, my, my point is about people in government and, and the culture that they bring with them. So um, that's my uh, pitch, that's my report from uh, DC uh, and what I saw when I was there. I'm now happily back in the Bay Area uh, and uh, trying to draw out some of these lessons and think about um, some of these themes. And so um, uh, in the last uh, 10 minutes of our hour, uh, there's a standing mic right there. If anybody wants to make a comment or raise a question, um, the floor is yours. Hi there, thanks for that presentation, really um, valuable. Uh, my question is about Washington State, when you were talking about what the governor was doing there. I was wondering if you had any information about uh, constituents, how they may have used some of the data that was publicly available, any testing information or any feedback that you had, how the press may have used it and how candidates in elections may have used that data. Um, well, so I can speak to that just a little bit. I, I would, I, 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 so, um, my take on, on GMAP is that it's a really fantastic management process and that the technology is awfully good but not quite what it should be. If you looked at some of the dashboards that I was showing, um, you'll note that they have you know, a few features. Uh, uh, they are, you know, it's, it's nicely done, but this is not easily parsable or machine readable or easily downloadable. And so um, it's beautifully presented, but it's still a little bit of the old contractor kind of approach to gold-plated websites you know, that aren't as um, stripped down and raw uh, the way that they ought to be, uh, raw in terms of the data that they provide. So um, uh, um, I will say that um, uh, to argue against my, my own, the point that I just made, I don't think that this initiative cropped up at all in her re-election campaign. She actually had a very tough re-election campaign. She ran against uh, uh, you know, a, a tough, strong uh, uh, opponent. But the issues were mostly about the unemployment rate um, and uh, 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 you know, um, traffic jams in Seattle and these kinds of things. And I think this sort of data can be part of her argument. You know, that she, she, I think it was part of her argument that she was changing government. But it's not like she built this awesome management system and then romped to a 90% acclimated re-election victory because everybody loved it so much. I do think it's really impressive, but I'm not sure that it's um, you know, a good example of how this kind of thing can be a central feature of a political discourse. I think it's still a little too early for that. Um, I think um, President Obama's campaign you know, injected in a big way the, uh, the idea that uh, Web 2.0 technologies can be an important fundamental part of, of, of the business of politics. We now have to make that same case for how it can be a fundamental part of the business of government. Go ahead. Yeah, is your mind map file going to be available for download? Uh, sure, I'll email it to you if that's okay. Um, I can also save this as a PDF if anybody doesn't use Mind Manager. It's a proprietary program, which is why I hesitate. Um, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't have a good way of converting it into a non-proprietary format, but maybe a, maybe a PDF is the closest thing. Hi. Hi. Uh, the Open for Questions technology that I, I see was sponsored or, or initiated by Google in the sort of in the back end, and uh, the Citizens Briefing book, excellent inventions for participatory democracy. Is there any talk in, in the Obama administration about really opening those up for, to actually talk about new legislation that would be from, from the people to control some of these idiotic things that come out of Washington. For instance, the Iraq war. It, you know, don't, it, is anyone talking about enabling the people to really use this technology to speak out on these issues? Yeah, so I, I know that their, that their ambitions are very much what you just said. In other words, the, the ambitions of um, the people that are currently in the White House um, um, uh, in various roles is to do exactly what you just said. In other words, to um, uh, really open out the decision-making process of government um, uh, to citizen input. Now, let me just say a word about, about participation and why it's hard. Um, so, the, 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 thing, the, the interesting thing about participation is that um, it is, uh, 
uh, um, wonderful in theory, but often very hard to manage in practice. So um, if you, the way I think about this and, and the way I talked about it on the transition is um, you've got some questions that government deals with that are very fact specific. Um, and you've got some questions uh, that government deals with that are very values driven. So, you know, an example of the first question is, um, you know, should a, uh, uh, you know, where should we situate a, a cell tower to serve southern San Francisco? Um, that's a pretty fact-driven question. There are scientific factors and range factors and uh, accessibility and land, all these different things. And uh, a question at the other end of the extreme is like, uh, should abortion be legal or not? And so, um, uh, oh, and, and one really good example, actually, of the fact-driven stuff is a program called Peer to Patent, um, which Beth Novick, who's now in the White House working on participation, actually pioneered. This is where the patent office um, uh, uh, takes a patent application uh, with the consent of the applicant and makes it publicly available um, for a period of time for people out in the community to review and then to contribute to the question of whether there is prior art. So this is a basically factual question, which is, you know, if you're claiming a patent invention, is there some prior patent that uh, covers that invention? And uh, uh, the beautiful thing about it is you can kind of crowdsource these inputs. Um, and the normal patent process keeps this process secret. So anyway, so if we've got peer to patent on one hand, which is you know, a very fact-driven question where you can crowdsource the question of whether there is prior art, yes or no, um, and abortion, should it be legal or illegal as, as, as sort of polar ends of this spectrum, participation, online participation, tends to work best in um, the fact-specific category. You know, if the government asks a very values-driven question and gets you know, a million emails generated by NARAL and uh, the National Right to Life Committee, um, it's kind of hard to know how to weight that um, in a decision-making process. On the other hand, if you're looking for factual data, um, uh, this uh, crowdsourcing may be a great way to do this. The problem is that most government decisions come somewhere in between. They've got some amount of values. You know, for example, uh, uh, what should the withdrawal date from Iraq be? That's a little bit factual. It's got a lot to do with your, your sense of, you know, the kind of grand um, sort of um, uh, uh, issues of the U.S. and Iraq. Um, you know, should we be there at all? Should we ever have gone there? Uh, what, what are our goals? What are our objectives? Very complicated questions. And so um, I think that what you're going to see, to um, bring this to a point, is that um, the Obama administration and its various agencies are going to be experimenting with lots of different small-scale tools like um, Ask the President or um, uh, the Citizen's Briefing book that are, you know, kind of focused little one-off experiments that will then evolve into platforms. So, uh, you know, eventually I expect the White House will have some commenting platforms and some interaction platforms and some collaboration platforms, participation, that will be pioneered in sort of one-off settings where they try to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And the real trick is to target the tool to the question. Um, there are tools that are good for really wide open-ended questions. There are tools that are good for very specific fact uh, questions. And uh, the one that you pick needs to fit the question very uh, precisely. Hi, I was on the development team for the DC Gov uh, back in 2000 to uh, actually 2008. So I was through both mayor administrations, Mayor Williams and Mayor Fenty. Um, back in the 2000 era, we didn't have any Web 2.0, of course. And part of the problem was uniting all the different agencies across a common platform for a look and feel and consistency. Um, and I understand that the federal government, of course, the White House and other things, all have their own separate fiefdoms. So I wondered how, if you had any suggestions on how they would be able to adopt common platforms that would be consistent for users, but also, um, I guess, uh, easily used by users. So this is a great question. Um, one of the interesting reforms in the 1990s that was positive in many respects, but you know, now has the kind of inevitable, unexpected second order, you know, or unanticipated second order consequences, was something called the Klinger-Cohen Act. So the Klinger-Cohen Act set up the federal government so that there is a CIO in every department and agency. The problem is that these CIOs have often you know, done good work at you know, making the emails uh, uh, you know, uh, work on time, you know, arrive on time, and that sort of thing. But now they operate as fiefdoms, and it's getting it's very hard to get CIOs now who are independent, they're accountable to their department head, not to any centralized IT authority, um, to uh, work together. An encouraging sign is that uh, the DC CTO is now the CIO of the federal government. Now, Vivek Kundra, um, he's in OMB, um, he's a great guy, he's very energetic, very innovative. 
And uh, he, because he's at OMB, has a role in budgets. So OMB gets the last word on federal agency budgets, which means that these CIOs are going to have to, through their department budget requests, go to OMB and deal with Vivek on their budgeting. I do think, though, that, um, that this is a case where um, attraction rather than coercion is going to be the best strategy. So what I, um, what I recommended and what the, um, uh, what the sort of broad consensus, I think, seems to be in the, in the, in, in, in the uh, government tech nerd community in DC is that the right approach is to start building a platform where you can, which is to say within GSA for things as simple as web services, and then build it over time and make it so cool and awesome that agencies are going to want to move their web services onto that platform. It'll be cheaper. It'll be better. It'll be standardized. It'll allow you to do consistent look and feel if you care. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. Um, but I think that this kind of honeypot strategy of attracting people to want to use these platforms because they're better, cheaper, more powerful, easier to use, make the agency heads look better, um, that's going to be the best strategy. Again, I think you start off with web services because they're pretty straightforward. Then maybe eventually you move into participation apps, collaboration apps, um, and so forth. Hi. So uh, Chris Hughes is on the cover of um, uh, Fast Company this, this month. And what Chris was able to do, I mean, his team is amazing. It's incredibly exciting in the sense that you know, it, it's not only transparency, but it's mobilizing and it's real time. I mean, all those things, it's, it's great. It's fantastic. I think, though, and I'm pretty sure he just joined, though, a pretty big political consulting firm. And my, my question is really about how that's going to play out in terms of, you know, okay, Obama is definitely, I think, the poster child of really using this in, in an, an effective way to not only mobilize people, but to change their strategy, get people together almost instantaneously. And are, are, is it going to be something that, like, a lot, a lot of candidates, a lot of elected officials will be able to, to successfully do, or is this really more about Obama himself? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I don't have any special wisdom about that other than to, to, to just note that, um, it's clear that a nationwide presidential campaign attracts a certain level of intensity that a local congressional candidate or even a Senate candidate has trouble matching. And so one of the things that you notice if, as you look at these tools is that they get less uh, energetic use the farther down the uh, political totem pole you go. So um, I, I know that every Senate candidate uh, and House candidate will want a vibrant online community of self-organizing people who carry them to victory in November, um, but that's uh, but that's but that's not always what happens. So I, I like I said, I don't have any special wisdom about it. I think it'll be fascinating to watch how it plays out. But I am glad to see that um, you know it's now considered mandatory to have a good website, lots of real-time video content, uh, a um, uh, an online community, whether it's through Facebook or. Um, um, or wherever, that's now just an essential feature of campaigning. Um, and I think uh, you, know, you don't have to look back you know, much farther than the Howard Dean campaign to realize that an awesome internet presence doesn't necessarily translate into ground game. So I think connecting those two things up is uh, part of what Barack Obama pulled off. And we'll see over the coming years whether other candidates can replicate that model. Hi. Um, watching all this has been very interesting. It's like watching kind of like an embryonic development from fetal. Uh, all the website stuff and platform interface still seems very crude. I'm wondering, will there be a time where you can literally do kind of like Sim Earth or Sim City or to educate the, the, the population with the president as kind of like an intermediary? What happens if we do this in Iraq? Well, this might happen over there and, you know, uh, Japan, or, but basically people start getting a simulated holistic kind of intuition. This, I think, is a start, but do you think we'll ever get to that, that stage? Yeah, I think we will. I mean, look, user interface always lags behind the back end, right? Like, we're, we've always been better at innovating, you know, ways of managing data than, we, than, than or faster than innovating ways of managing data than presenting the data. So, mm -hmm. look, I think, the, the, I think the, 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 the sequence here is that we should be striving to get as much data Right. Um, out there and then rely on the community and the kind of uh, evolutionary um, uh, 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 patterns that, that seem to apply to web-based uh, uh, services to get the user interfaces where they should be. Okay, because I think that'll cause a change in literally consciousness when people can start seeing how these decisions uh, in simulation can actually lead to this trajectory or that trajectory. Uh, so anyway, that's, I, I hope that we 
continue can evolve towards a more, more you know, holistic kind of paradigm. All right, so we're five minutes over, so we need to um, be sort of brisk. But why don't we take these last two comments or questions, and then we'll, uh, we'll close. Thanks. In the same way that you're seeing a trend toward greater transparency um, in government processes, is there reason to believe that our government is getting smart about avoiding vendor lock-in and making code that is um, the lowest level visible to citizens for whatever it builds? Um, and so it's a great question. Um, uh, I think, um, you know, I see some encouraging signs, but I can't say that it's kind of like a flood towards, uh, you know, towards openness around code. Um, uh, I do see um, a, you know, growing cadre of um, people in the departments and agencies at the federal level who believe in open code. But I think one of the things that we're going to need to do as a community uh, around uh, the federal government is create spaces, um, you know, source forges for, uh, for um, uh, government running you know, code that the government wants to run. Um, because, uh, you know, there's just a, a level of scrutiny and perfection um, and stability that is required for something like whitehouse.gov that can really inhibit innovation unless we create some alternate spaces where government people, together with the broader development communities, um, can work together, iterate, try stuff out, launch quickly, um, um, see what happens, and then, uh, uh, and then eventually move on to these kind of gold-plated production sites like, uh, like, like whitehouse.gov. Anyway, I think that's something we need to do. Tim? Yeah, uh, Tim was just mentioning forge.mil. I mean, again, this is actually a really interesting um, phenomenon, which is that, that the defense and intelligence communities are um, pioneering government use of these technologies. They're way ahead of the rest of the government when it comes to um, um, figuring out how to, how to do things. You know, for example, Intellipedia is a, is a wiki information um, collection and writing system that the intelligence community is now using um, with incredible success. Once they got themselves past the security problems that they always assumed would apply to, um, you know, uh, uh, wiki-type technologies, they realized that it's a, it's a staggeringly efficient way to get it data out of the brains of the many thousands of experts that they've got within their, uh, within their communities. And uh, uh, the uh, defense, um, uh, the uh, DISA and uh, DARPA and some of these other agencies are also you know, doing really, really smart things about, um, uh, about, about it. What we need to do is uh, move those um, conversations and move those efforts um, uh, into the public, which is what forge.mil is, is, is all about. Last, uh, last comment. Uh, just uh, where do you see the future of uh, electronic voting to that? <laughs> electronic ever? voting? Yeah, so I'm a, I, 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 I'm a skeptic about electronic voting. I, I, I don't have any kind of a deep insights on that sucker either. There are many, in this room, I'm sure there are many smarter people about that than I am, but um, I'm of the view that, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, the idea that you can produce ironclad code that uh, can never be tampered with and never be altered and never be messed up uh, is a pretty foreign concept to me. So uh, I tend to like uh, voting processes that have got something physical that you can look at and, uh, and tally up later in the event of catastrophe. I don't know if you guys saw that, you know, there were, there were just indictments in Kentucky um, for officials tampering in, 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 a, in, a, in a certain way um, with electronic voting systems um, by basically like not telling people that they had to push the confirm button at the very end of the process. And then as soon as these people left the vo uh, voting booth, the, uh, the, the, the indicted uh, election monitor would wander in, change the vote, and then hit submit. But you know, like there's, uh, there's just tons of ways for those sorts of things to be messed up. I like things that are sort of verifiable, whether you call that a paper trail or something else. But like I said, there's smarter, better people to know about, uh, who know about that. Anyway, thank you all very much.